Do you ever notice how throughout your day you tend to have the same exact thoughts over and over and over again? Some certain idea or fear or past failure will just get stuck in your mind and you can make it go away for a while, but it seems like no matter what you do, you keep coming back to the same thought over and over and over again. You're not crazy and it's not just you. That actually somewhat unfortunately, is how our brains legitimately work. Just like how if you walk through a dense forest, you can sometimes find paths or trails that have been created by other animals where it's a little bit easier to get through and you will kind of naturally end up following these paths because they provide less resistance than just pushing through this dense undergrowth that no one has ever tried to push through before. Your brain is the exact same way. Your brain has about a hundred billion neurons. And theoretically, any neuron can lead to any other neuron. Like any thought can lead to any thought. Any feeling can lead to any feeling. Theoretically. But that's not what actually happens. What actually happens is your brain often likes to take the path of least resistance. And so the same stimuli or triggers or same types of experiences will often end with the same type of conclusion because your brain has pathways. More specifically, you have bad habits. You have bad thinking habits. And that's really what all this comes down to. The good news is you can undo those habits and you can start to recreate the pathways in your brain so that they end up in places that are more beneficial to you. Welcome back to the psychology of depression and anxiety. If this is your first time here, I'm your host, Dr. Scott. I'm a licensed full-time practicing clinical psychologist. I do individual and group therapy. I am the founder and clinical director of two intensive outpatient programs for moderate to severe mood and anxiety disorders. I am also the author of the book, For When Everything is Burning, and it is a pleasure to have you here today. So our topic is mindfulness. And right away, you might have some feelings about that. Mindfulness, I know, is kind of like a loaded word. And for a lot of people, honestly, including me uh, in the past, at least, it brings up a lot of like new agey, spiritual or pseudo spiritual ideas. It, it may be perceived as as kind of an unscientific practice. Um, it might, you might think of meditation or relaxation techniques or someone sitting in a dark room with a candle and a blindfold on. Maybe that one's just me. I don't know. But I, I had a negative view of mindfulness for a while. I thought it was very like hokey and gimmicky and, and soft for lack of a better term. And I really honestly didn't take it seriously, uh, for the first few years of my clinical practice. And I regret that now because mindfulness, if done correctly, if defined and applied correctly is an incredibly powerful tool for depression and anxiety. I would easily put it in my top 10. It is something I think most people who deal with depression and anxiety are going to need at least a basic understanding of in order to get where they want to be. The way that I define mindfulness is quite simple. Um, so when I talk about mindfulness today, I'm really just talking about one thing. My definition of mindfulness is to take conscious control over the process of choosing what to direct your attention to. So this is something that happens every second of every day. You have a finite amount of attention. There is only so much stimuli that you can take in at once. And you also have internal stimuli happening too, right? You have emotions and appraisals and memories. That stuff's all happening inside. And then there's also a bunch of stuff happening outside of you. Um, even if there's not, even if you're not in a super high stimuli environment right now, even just all of the objects and the colors in the room you're currently in is more information than you can consciously process and manage simultaneously. So every second of every day, throughout the day, your brain is making decisions. It's very similar to your feed or your home screen on social media. Every time you get on social media, more new content has been created and posted than you could possibly consume, right? It, it is impossible to consume all the social media. You, you can't do it. It's being made faster than you can watch it or listen to it or whatever. Um, so you have, you know, a homepage or a for you page or a feed or whatever they call it on your social media of choice. And essentially what is happening is that app or that that website has an algorithm 
and it has learned who it thinks you are and what it thinks you're into. And it's taking all this stuff that's happened since the last time you logged on and it's condensing it down to a tiny little fraction of what's actually out there. And it's showing you that. And it's saying, here's what I think you would like. You know, Here's what I think you're into. Your brain does the exact same thing. And anytime you've gotten onto a new social media platform, you might have noticed that it sometimes takes a while for the algorithm to understand you. For a while, when I first got on TikTok, like the first month that I was on TikTok, TikTok, excuse me, TikTok thought that I was super passionate about two things. And I don't know where either of these came from. <laughs> White rappers, which it's fine. Not, not a huge passion of mine. I don't dislike them. But, but TikTok thought I really liked white hip hop artists. TikTok also thought that I really liked servals, which I didn't even know what they were before TikTok. And you might not know either. They're like these big, um, I think they're wild cats that some people have as pets. They kind of look like miniature jaguars, I guess. Um, I don't know if I just accidentally watched one video or what, but my entire For You page on TikTok for like a month was white hip hop artists and servals just alternating back and forth. Neither of which are huge areas of interest to me. I somehow taught the algorithm that these are things that I'm passionate about. And so it kept showing me these. And so when I first got on TikTok, I'm like, man, TikTok is weird. Like, why? why? <laughs> this is such random content. I didn't totally understand what was happening yet. The same thing can happen with your brain. There's an incomprehensible amount of stuff out there, but your brain is only going to digest and present to your consciousness a very, very small fraction, like, like in, uh, an incredibly small fraction of what's actually happening in your life. And what that fraction is that you consciously interpret and appraise basically determines your world. Because those are the only parts of your life that you actually experience, this little microcosm of the world that your brain thinks is the stuff you want to pay attention to. And just like your social media algorithm, your brain makes these decisions primarily based on what have you directed your attention to in the past. Now, if you're someone who has a chronic mood or anxiety disorder, you can probably see where I'm going with this. When you've been in a really deep depression spiral or had a long period of heightened anxiety, pathways in your brain are created that link almost everything that's happening in your life to I'm a failure or everything's going to fall apart or some like catastrophic end game that your brain keeps coming back to over and over and over again. Just like how you can reset or retrain your feed or your algorithm and social media, you can retrain your brain to not end every single thought or every single idea with some horrible, depressing, anxiety provoking situation but it takes a lot of practice and it takes conscious redirection of your attention. You have to notice that you're going down this pathway, intercept your attention and send it somewhere else. In other words, you have to practice mindfulness. That's what this is. So very broadly speaking, a person's attention can be in one of three areas chronologically. Sometimes we are mostly focused on the past, Sometimes we are mostly focused on the present, and sometimes we are mostly focused on the future. One tip that I can teach you right away is overall, it's going to be much, much better for your mood and your symptoms to try to keep your attention in the present as often as possible. When we spend a lot of time ruminating on the past, pretty much inevitably, you spend too, you can be there for a little bit, you'll be okay. You spend too much time over there, at some point, you are going to go down a spiral. You are going to get sucked down into some black hole of grief and regret and loss and failure and whatever else is in your past. It is a minefield back there, and you do not want to hang out there too long or you will get caught. The future is also a dangerous place to spend too much time. That tends to open the door to a lot of anxiety thoughts because we start to think, how long can I really do this for? Am I ever going to get where I want in life? Is everything going to fall apart? Is everyone going to hate me? Am I going to get fired? Am I going to die? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? We don't want to spend too much time in these areas. They will trigger our depressed and anxious thought processes. So trying to stay present 
is one of the core tenets of mindfulness. One of the simplest ways to do that is to think about the five sources of information you have. So these are called in the world of sensory motor psychotherapy, uh, which is a, uh, a trauma therapy. We call these the five you know, we call these the five core organizers. They are thoughts, emotions, physical sensations, movement or movement urges, and sensory information. So anything that you take in, basically, like all your attention is going to one of these five things. Your thoughts can be all over the place chronologically, right? Your thoughts can be in the past, your thoughts can be in the present, your thoughts can be in the future. But those other four organizers are exclusively present moment sensations. Your you, you can have feelings about the past or the future, but the feeling itself is a present moment experience. And in fact, the feeling that you have about something in the past, for example, when you think about it today might be different than the feeling that you experienced during that event. So that emotion is a present moment experience. Your physical sensations, your body is only taking in physical information right now. So if you tune into anything happening in your body, even just something as simple as like this, this is like the cliche, every person who's ever talked about mindfulness uses this example, but it works because it probably applies to you right now. You're probably either sitting down, laying down or standing up, right? I guess those are really the only options unless you're like levitating or something. So some part of your body currently is making contact with either the ground or a chair or a bed or a couch or whatever it is. And, and until I said that, you might have, when I said that, you might have noticed and been like, oh yeah, I feel that. Until I said that, you, you had no awareness of that, did you? I mean, on some subconscious level, you knew like I'm not floating, I'm, I'm being supported by some object, but you weren't feeling it. Your attention was not being directed to that stimuli. And it probably did become directed to that stimuli when I pointed it out. So you just did a mindfulness activity. Congratulations, A plus, nice work. You can do that all the time. And when you do that, if you're really spiraling in a thought pattern, just tuning into something in the present, even if it's not like reassuring or, or important, like I can feel my back on the chair right now. Does that create a deep sense of like safety or comfort in me? Am I, am I feeling gratitude towards the chair for not breaking? No, it's not so much that. It's just that it gets my mind a little bit less focused on whatever it was on before. And as you guys know, a lot of the times we get stuck on the same thoughts over and over and over again. And a lot, sometimes the only way out of that is to redirect your attention to a different stimuli. The five senses are another great one, right? Sight, touch, taste, sound, and smell. That's all information that you're taking in right now. And so if you work on trying to consciously redirect your attention to any sensory stimuli that you're experiencing, a little bit less attention is going towards the ruminative thought patterns because you only have so much attention at any given moment. And so redirecting it to a neutral stimuli reduces the amount of resources that are going to keep this distressing thought pattern going over and over and over again. The reason it's so important, I know I kind of explained this already, but I just want to make sure you know, it's not just my opinion that spending more time in the present is better for your mental health. This is a topic that is very well covered in empirical literature. They've even done some amazing controls on this, by the way. Like they have controlled for, well, what if you're thinking about a really happy memory? What if you're not having some depressive spiral? What if you're thinking about a really fun time in your past, something that was really awesome? Or, or what if you're not having anxious thoughts about the future? What if you're planning your dream vacation? What if you're planning your, well, I was going to say planning your wedding. That's a terrible example because that actually is really anxiety provoking. Um, but even if you're thinking about something in the future that you're just really excited for and really happy about, your mood still tends to be better when it's more present focused, even if the present moment is like not incredibly amazing. And we don't technically know why that is. We just know that it is. My theory is the present moment is just so much more rich because it has those other organizers in it. It has that other stimuli in it. And when you like daydream about something you might do someday, yeah, that might be a, a fantastic, you know, fantasy in your head, but there's, there's no other stimuli. It's just a thought. It's just like this cloud in your brain that just goes away eventually. And there's nothing 
connecting you to it. It's kind of like, I, I would rather go on, you know, kind of a relatively uninteresting middle of the road vacation than watch somebody's dream vacation on YouTube. Like, yeah, maybe they're in a way cooler, more exciting place. Maybe I'm just like in a random hotel somewhere, but mine's real and it's actually happening. And so that's still going to give me more ultimately than just like watching someone else do something, which is basically what fantasizing about the past or the future is. It's just, it, it's not real and it doesn't give you anything concrete or tangible to hold on to. Now, if you have gotten pretty good at focusing on the present, there's one other thing you have to overcome. And that is something called your attention to threat bias. All human beings have this. Actually, all mammals have this because it's a survival response. Attention to threat bias just refers to our tendency to, if there's anything in our environment that feels potentially dangerous or unsafe, that is where the majority of our attention will be directed. That's what we will kind of get stuck on. And our brains kind of use the idea of dangerous a, a little bit loosely. Um, danger doesn't necessarily mean there's there's something that you think is like a threat to your mortal existence. You know, we think of things like rejection or failure or embarrassment, you know, these things feel dangerous to us. And so if there's anything happening around us that makes it feel like we might be about to experience an emotion like that, we will get locked on to that stimuli and everything else around you kind of fades away. Imagine you're in the center of this series of dots and every dot represents some kind of stimuli outside of you. Blue dots represent signs that you are safe and red dots represent signs that you are unsafe. And there's all these dots scattered around you and you can only see a narrow little window of these dots at any given time. If there's a cluster of three red dots over here and everywhere else around you is a hundred blue dots and you lock on to those three red dots and that's all you see and that's what you focus on, you're going to feel completely unsafe in your environment, even though 98% of it tells you that you are safe. That's how perception works. That's why mindfulness is so important. And so when we let our subconscious minds choose what to pay attention to, they will always choose the worst thing. They will literally always choose the worst thing because anything that is potentially threatening feels important. Anything that could go wrong, anything that could hurt us, anything that could cause us to feel a distressing emotion, our brains tell us that's the most important thing in the world right now. That's the thing that under no circumstances should you allow yourself not to think about. I don't care if everything else around you is good. I don't care if 99% of your life is awesome right now. This thing you need to stay focused on because this is the one thing that could sink you and make everything fall apart. And that one thing is going to get such a disproportionate amount of your attention if you don't take control over this process that your life can be absolutely miserable even if you have all the building blocks to make it good. That's why mindfulness is so important. Now, it would be exhausting to have to just basically micromanage your brain and the direction of your attention 24 seven. The good news is you will not have to do that. You may have to do something closer to that at first, but again, just like you can retrain your social media algorithm to stop showing you weird stuff that you're not that into, you can retrain your brain to redirect towards things other than the worst case scenario every single time anything comes up. Your brain works on an algorithmic structure and it can and will learn if you teach it. But you have to try to make it take a different pathway. Every time you let it go to that worst case scenario, you are strengthening that pathway. You are deepening that trail through the forest of your mind, and it's going to be harder and harder to take a new path every time you let that thought complete. So there are two strategies I'm going to teach you, other than just the five core organizer and the staying present stuff that we already talked about, two specific strategies I'm going to teach you to try to catch yourself in the middle of these, because I, I know that they happen really fast. Like even if it's a series of seven, eight, nine different thoughts, sometimes it only takes but two seconds for you to get from something in my environment to like, I'm going to die and then everything's going to fall apart. It can happen so quickly, but there's a couple strategies you can use to stop it in its tracks and try to take a different route through your mind. The first is something I call zooming out. Um, I use this today. So let me give you an example of zooming out. Today, I took my daughter to the beach. It was 82 degrees here today, which for Iowa in late September is not, um, not a very normal thing. So I had to take advantage of that. 
she had a great time. She was splashing and laughing and finding cool rocks. And just like, it was objectively, it was a wonderful moment. However, I am currently in the middle of probably starting my own therapy practice, which I've never done before. And it's really, really daunting. And so even though I'm someone who generally has a pretty high level of confidence in my abilities at this point in my life, it still freaks me out. It does. And there were so many times at the beach today when I'd just be watching her play and just smiling. And, and then my brain would go like, hey, hey, I don't know why this is always my brain voice, by the way. I did this last time too. Hey, man, you, you know you're going to lose all this, right? You can, you can start your own practice. You don't know how to do that. It's all going to fall apart and then you're not going to be able to go to the beach anymore because you're going to have to move back in with your parents or something. You're not going to have any, you're not going to have any money. And this moment right here, this, this beautiful moment that you're loving, this might be, this is the last beach day of the year. By next spring, you might be broken, unemployed. So enjoy this while it lasts because this, this is the last time you're ever going to get to do this. That might sound ridiculous, but I bet to most of you, it doesn't. Even if you haven't experienced that specific thought process, I, I bet you can see how I get from like, wow, this is just a really wonderful, special moment in my life to like, everything's going to fall apart. And, and you know, I said all of that out loud so that you could hear it in my head. That happens way faster because I don't actually have to say all of those words. It's like two or three seconds. And so often, I mean, that happened, I don't know, a hundred times in like the three hours we were there. And so zooming out is a, is a strategy that I use. I think I invented it. Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't matter. You, you, you know, those scenes in movies where the, the scene will start and it's really zoomed in on something like, like a cup of coffee or something. Right. And, and you don't even know like, why is this cup of coffee important? And then it pans out and you see this is a diner and there's two people talking, right? And then it pans out again and you see this diner is full of people and then it pans out again. And it's like, oh, this is New York City. And like it, it zooms out. And so at first you were laser focused on one little thing. And then eventually you see, okay, this is this is what the situation is right now. I have found, at least for me, and, and I've taught this to a lot of my therapy clients too, and they seem to think that this works for them. When you zoom out and sort of take a bird's eye view of what's actually happening in the moment for you, it tends to just like lock you back into the present for a while. So I basically, you know, at the beach, I'd imagine like my brain getting carried away by a drone and just seeing the scene of like this father and his daughter playing at the beach on a warm, you know, early fall day. Um, and there's like nobody else there because it's September and no one goes to the beach in September in Iowa. Um, and, and just seeing that whole picture, like from the sky, what it would look like. Every time I use that, it just snaps me back into the present. I don't know what it is about that technique, but it really just pulls me out of the rumination, pulls me out of the fatalistic, negative thought process and just right back into the moment. So I use that one over and over and over again. And with after probably 90 minutes or so, I noticed... My brain wasn't going there as much. My brain wasn't trying to keep drawing my attention back to the failure thoughts because I had taught it basically like, I'm not interested in this. So you know how on, I, I know you can do this on YouTube. You know, if you look through, if, if you like started to watch something and you realize like, oh, I don't really like this. If you go into your history and delete that, it won't use it in the algorithm, right? And you're basically telling it, I'm actually not into like, this was a mistake. I shouldn't have been watching this. I'm not into that. Please don't show me more stuff like that. I actually kind of hated that. That's what I was teaching my brain in that moment. Like, no, I'm not into this. I don't need to be stressing about my future right now. I am into this moment. I am into being at the beach with my daughter. That's where I want you to be sending these resources. Please keep sending it here. And eventually it started to kind of figure it out. So that's how you use zooming out to redirect your attention and essentially hack your mental algorithm. The other strategy I want to teach you about today is what is called mindfulness questions. There's tons of these. You can Google them. I definitely did not make these up. Um, not the concept anyway, but I have two specific mindfulness questions that I find incredibly helpful to keep my attention focused on what matters most. Um, and so a mindfulness question is basically just a question you ask yourself and then answer 
in your mind to try to gain control over what you're thinking about, essentially. The one I use the most often by far, and I also used it today on the beach, is what do I want to remember about this moment? So you know how you have, there's periods of time in your life that certain events, certain experiences, you know, were like really good or really neat or really exciting. And you don't remember them very well. And sometimes even, you know, it might even be something pretty recent and something that you think like that should have been really memorable, but you just have lots of big gaps. And maybe when you talk to, if, if it's something to do with other people, maybe you talk to people that were there and they remember stuff and you're like, I don't even remember that part of the experience. You can only remember things that you paid attention to. And so if you're in the middle of some really neat experience and like me, you've got some, you know, nonstop stressful thought in the back of your mind, every time that thought comes to the forefront and demands the majority of your attention, you have missed a memory because you were not paying attention to that moment. And so your brain was unable to encode whatever was actually happening around you because your attention was directed inward to this negative thought. So when I ask myself and then answer, what do I want to remember most about this moment? That tends to get my attention back on the thing that matters most. I want to remember my daughter's smile with her wet dripping hair framing her face. I don't need to remember that I was stressed. I'll figure it out. It's not that important. The other mindfulness question that I like, and this one is more useful during higher stress or higher intensity situations. This one you can even use for trauma triggers as well. This one is, is to get at the attention to threat bias. Remember that your attention to threat bias will direct your attention to what feels most threatening. And that can feel like your entire world or your entire environment, even if it's a relatively small proportion of what's actually happening around you. If you ask and answer the question, are there any signs in this moment that everything is completely fine? And, and, and you can use this with regular life stressors too. This doesn't have to be trauma. Our brains will always search for the signs that something is not right. And it can always find something. Always. That's what's so frustrating about this. Your life is never going to be perfect. So as long as that thought pattern exists in your mind, as long as that thought pattern, what is the worst thing in my life right now? What is the biggest problem I'm facing? What is the most stressful thing in my environment? As long as that exists, it's going to be really hard for you to ever feel content because you're always going to find something. But what if that thing is relatively small? What if the majority of what's surrounding you, the majority of what's going on is good or, or just fine? Maybe it's not even good. Maybe it's just like, it's fine. It's all right. Are there any signs in this moment that everything is completely fine? Are, 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 maybe there's more than one. Are there many signs in this moment that everything is completely fine? There might be a lot. There might be so much that your brain is not pushing up to your conscious awareness, is not putting into your mental algorithm that would make you realize like you're all right. It's not getting triggered. You're not seeing it because your brain is so fine tuned to only see the worst parts and the biggest problems. Don't, don't hear this as invalidating. Please don't hear this as invalidating. I'm not saying ignore your problems. I'm not saying your life is completely fine. What are you stressing about? I know that that's not always the case, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. Sometimes we're all right. Sometimes things are pretty good or at least decent. And it doesn't feel that way because our brains won't let us focus on those things. Mindfulness strategies like the ones I've taught you today can help you stay focused on those parts of your life. It can help you basically hack your algorithm and make sure that you get to pay attention to the things you want to pay attention to because you have worked hard for those things. You have good things in your life that you have worked so hard for, and you deserve to enjoy that. You deserve to feel good about that and not have it constantly stolen from you by faulty, defective, biased thought processes. So I hope you can use these mindfulness strategies today to recode some of these pathways in your brain and to enjoy your life more because that's what we all want, right? Take care. I'll see you next time.